Now, you've heard a lot about corn ethanol. That's not what we're here to talk about today. In fact, there's only two things wrong with corn-based ethanol. That's corn <laughs> and ethanol. In the next 45 minutes, we're going to talk about a different kind of renewable fuel and resource. And of course, that's going to be sugars from non-food sources. What I'd like to do is go straight to our panel and invite the panelists now to join me on stage, and I'll introduce them. <clears throat> Have a seat, please. This is going to be a remarkable way to uh, cover this new terrain and that's to reach from one side of the country to the other, from California to Washington, D.C., to right here at home in Pennsylvania. And I'm going to introduce to you our three panelists who uh, cover leadership in new companies, in, uh, in giant established uh, uh, players in the American economic scene, and, and the leading edge of research. So John Mello of uh, Amherst Company is the CEO of uh, one of the most uh, uh, forward-leaning and highly valued new uh, uh, renewable chemicals and fuels company. Amaris finds somewhere in the world, today in Brazil, uh, renewable sugars and, and makes both specialty chemical and renewable par products in partnership with others. Uh, before John joined Amaris, he uh, had 20 years of combined business experience as a leader in the global fuels industry. He was president of uh, British Petroleum Fuels and in the U.S., and also their chief information officer. So he's a, he's a bona fide technologist in geek, just as is uh, uh, Vic Prabhu, to uh, the center of this group. Vic is the head of strategy and new ventures at DuPont. And uh, he has a, a deep technical background. He's been part of DuPont's industrial biotechnology effort for more than a decade. And he uh, uh, really is the strategy leader for DuPont's billion dollars new industrial biofuels business. Part of that business, you may remember, is when DuPont acquired Danisco for six and a half billion dollars. And then uh, another one of these hybrid genius <coughs> businessmen, technology leaders is Paul Bryant. I'm very pleased to have Paul with us today. Paul heads the Department of Energy's biomass program, uh, and he joined that program in, in 2010, a couple of years ago, uh, becoming a bureaucrat, right? Uh, he, he spent before that 15 years at Chevron, and in the last four years of his assignment at Chevron, he led their technical efforts in biofuels as uh, vice president of, of their technologies. I give you some idea of, I think, the ambition and uh, great work that the Department of Energy is doing. Uh, Paul led the department to recently announce a $510 million initiative with both the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Navy to develop ways to drop in advanced biofuels for both military and commercial transportation. So I, there's three things that themes uh, I want to cover today. Th those are where sugar demand is and what it's going to take to cause this demand to ignite into really explosive growth. Two, what benefits and possibilities are going to unfold as sugars become cheaper and cheaper. And then three, how these breakthroughs in supply, demand, and economics are going to drive the creation of, of new industries, new strategic uh, partnerships. So, panelists in no particular order. I'll begin with John and feel free to uh, pile in. Uh, what's got to happen, John, over the next couple of years for uh, uh, renewable fuels and renewable chemicals to become a, 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 a thriving kind of global industry? First of all, good morning and thanks, uh, John, for the opportunity to be here. And it is great to be in a state that actually can put uh, strategy policy and plan together around the word energy. So it is, uh, it is an honor to be here. Uh, and uh, you might want to take the guidebook for connecting uh, policy, strategy, and plan around energy and send it to Pennsylvania Avenue. It'll be uh, probably a good place to give some guidance. Uh, and it is, it's kind of interesting that we're here also where crude oil 
kind of started for our country. Yeah. So in connecting the two and answering your question, uh, I, I really believe that for the success of this industry called biomaterials, products, fuels, uh, to really uh, have success, we need uh, better, more sustainable, lower cost sources of carbon, which is what Bryn Maddox can give us. It's what sugarcane gives us today. Uh, and it's really the replacement for oil, the new oil. So, so connect carbon for me with sugar. I think of sugar as something that's white or brown and it makes my oatmeal better. When I think of carbon, I think of coal and stuff I don't want in my oatmeal. What's going on there? It's, a, it's, a, it's really the, uh, the most uh, accessible way to sun power. And you got to think of it as uh, the, the sun kind of shines on us uh, and we collect its power in many different ways. One way is through plant. And it's really the, the, the carbon accumulation in plant from sunlight that what we, what we need to do in many ways and what we do today through certain plants is extract the value of those plants, the carbon value of those plants, and then reconstruct that carbon to make products. Mm -hmm. So the connection of uh, biology with plant life is in a way uh, engineering organisms, bugs, to take the carbon that's captured in the plant from the sun and reconstruct that carbon to make high value products. Right. Uh, like everything from what can go into tire material, isoprene, to what can go into cosmetics, squalane, to what goes into your vehicle, which could be diesel or a great gasoline, something that's a hydrocarbon, a pure hydrocarbon, rather than alcohol. So almost in every walk of life, there is an application for being able to make great products by whether it's a chemical process or biology converting carbon from plant into those new products. Okay, so close the circle for me. I've got sunlight, it's uh, causing carbon to grow in plants. Uh, I harvest that carbon from living plants or maybe I pump it out of the ground from dead plants and then I use that to make nylon or fuels or, and then what happens? So let's, uh, first of all, in the example you used, John, the amazing thing about, about nature and science is that we can accelerate what used to take millions of years to do. Yeah. So instead of taking carbon from the ground, oil, right. uh, we actually take it from plant and process it in a very accelerated fashion. Right. Instead of taking millions of years, uh, we could take hours to process that carbon. Right. And then, then what happens is you restructure the carbon to make material. Right. So that material uh, is a, some kind of chemical, right. whether that chemical is a hydrocarbon structure for a fuel right. or a structure for a plastic material uh, or for uh, synthetic rubber into a tire. So, so then it's a plastic uh, that I might bury in a landfill or it's a fuel that I might burn. And the, there's a kind of, they, they say there's a carbon cycle going on, what's that? The, there, there is a cycle going on. The amazing thing about this new cycle is uh, in all the applications that you do through a renewable process, like using right. the biology, the product then becomes biodegradable. Yeah. So you no longer have the, again, could be many year cycle on the back end. So you are in effect closing the cycle very quickly, making it much more sustainable and using all of nature right. to actually end up making uh, the end product. So, so Vic, explain this to us. How important is uh, carbon or raw materials from carbon to DuPont? How much of that do you buy or use a year? Uh, John, again, uh, I'll echo uh, John's comment. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you, uh, distinguished panel, and uh, I think a very nice uh, group of guests uh, to interact with us on this very important national topic. Um, and, and rather than just speak from DuPont's point of view, I think from a national point of view, we do need a really stable source of materials that can fund a number of industries that we're talking about here. And so the, 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 the problem is complex. The solutions are not trivial. But I think we have the intellectual horsepower. We need to put together stable markets so that we can have a long-term view in developing these technologies. And I think we have great talent in this country to bring this to bear. Yeah. But how important is carbon to DuPont? Absolutely. Does every DuPont product rely on carbon? Yes, almost anything we make is starts with some form of carbon. And uh, we're on a very long journey ourselves to wean ourselves from oil. Um, and we've put a lot of investment in over the last 10 to 15 years. Our first uh, product today uh, is uh, called Serona. 
we've been developing this. Uh, it's a natural fiber. Uh, actually, it's, it's mingled between a petroleum-derived and a bio-derived source. We thought this was the easiest way to take risk out and bring it into the market. So this is critical in all of our businesses, materials businesses. Uh, t tell, tell me this, Vic. Uh, what, let's go to the question we started with John for the moment. What is it going to take to ignite or cause there to be explosive demand at DuPont or other places in the industry for uh, renewable sugar? Well, I think we need to have stable policy and a, and a, and a, and a predictable market for these products we're trying to develop. Right. Um, and we need to have, I think, a clear uh, environment of investment to take these to scale. Because there's a lot of very, very interesting technology being developed. They're at early stage. We need to bring them to scale. Only then will they have impact on the economy, start having impact on jobs. Now, I'm interested in the role of innovation here. I know we all are. Everybody's keen on the future. If I handed you the magic sugar wand, and I said you can, you can have two wishes, or uh, if you were running China, you can issue two edicts to move forward the uh, carbon economy. Uh, what would those be? I think uh, certainly policy that uh, encourages investment in this area uh, would be, I think, um, a, a very solid step in, in so getting more investment. support. Yeah, Is more investment. A second wish? And I think really uh, uh, an environment that fosters innovation uh, to integrate, because a lot of the science that it's not just biology or chemistry, uh, it's really biology and physics and chemistry coming together. Right. So an, an, an innovation economy that can integrate the really interesting technology and around sugar and the kinds of work that John's company is doing, we've got to bring those together. So you want to get that biologist and that physicist so out of the ocean, yes. and have them working onshore with, with the, the chemist, chemist to yeah. make these great new products. I want to crystallize the, the two who were solubilized. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, Paul, I'm going to hand you the magic sugar wand. You sure. Can make two wishes uh, for whatever kind of innovation, breakthroughs, or national agenda you think matter. All right. Well, I'll do that in a second. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the kind introduction and, and say that it's wonderful to be back in Pennsylvania. I grew up in the northwestern corner of this state, uh, very close to where oil was discovered, uh, but also in dairy farming country, and I handled what seemed like thousands, if not millions, of bales of biomass uh, during the summer each year in the, in, in the form of hay, and, and I regard uh, breaking biomass down into sugar as a form of revenge. Well, you, you know, across the range of biomass, I think hay is a kind of sweet-smelling biomass you'd prefer to deal with. On a dairy farm, there's a lot of other biomass that's much less pleasant. <laughs> um, but in answer to your question, uh, I, I, have, I have two magic wands. Uh, one of them is a policy wand also, uh, and the other is a technical one. Uh, the policy wand that I would wave is to burden the crude oil that we use with its true societal cost. Uh, people do complain, including me from time to time, about a cost to fill our, our, our tanks with, uh, with petroleum-derived fuel. Uh, but at that, we're paying only a fraction of the true societal cost. Mm -hmm. I believe that if uh, petroleum-based fuels, particularly those based on imported petroleum, were burdened with their true societal cost, we would be competitive with biomass-based fuels today. All right. So what are these additional? It sounds to me like you're going to tax gasoline or put a price on carbon or some of these things that George Schultz and Tom Friedman all think we must do. Well, Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there, there are a number of different mechanisms, a uh, number of different mechanisms to, uh, to take care of that, but, but the fact is we, we have to uh, spend a, a huge uh, amount of our balance of trade on importing uh, crude oil, $300 billion a year. That's roughly double the value of all crops produced in the United States. Wow. If we could convert a significant fraction of that to domestically produced crops with domestic jobs for converting that into fuel, we could keep that in our own economic cycle, particularly in rural America. Okay, so for a moment, I'm going to take away one of your wands. <laughs> and suppose that we can't do that. Sure. We can't put a price on carbon. What is the future for renewable sugars, sugars not from corn, but right. sugars from wood chips or some other kind of biomass without that price on carbon? Sure. Well, we, we recently compete, completed a study. It was an update to a 2005 study called the Billion Ton Study, 
uh, where we, we verified that there's more than a billion tons of biomass available sustainably and economically in the United States every year to make into biofuels or bioproducts. So I think the, uh, there are really three steps between having that biomass and having economically viable industry based on them. Uh, I, I think the two of them are well along the way to being solved, and one of them we're talking about here today, which is converting biomass into sugars that can be fermented into fuels or products. I also think there's an explosion in the technology of synthetic biology that's allowing us to make fuels and value-added products from those sugars. The magic wand I would wave has to do with the logistics problem. The biomass we get is not like crude oil. Crude oil accumulated over thousands or tens of thousands of years in one spot where we can drill a hole in the, in the ground and produce it. Biomass is not concentrated that way. We get it grown each year in a very dispersed fashion. So there's a lot of it around, but it's very expensive to bring to a central point for further processing. So where I would wave my magic wand, and where, I, where I'm trying to do that right now at the Department of Energy. How big is your magic wand, by the way? <laughs> well, uh, you'll have to talk to Congress about that. They, uh, they, they vary the size of my wand from year to year. Um, <laughs> how, how about in the last year? How uh, his, historically, it's been in the neighborhood of $200 million a year. Uh -huh. uh, we did get an injection of about a billion dollars from the economic stimulus package, uh, the uh, American Reinvestment and Recovery Act. Uh, and there'll be another, we hope, another significant injection for this uh, USDA Navy DOE joint venture that you mentioned. But the, the, re the appropriated budget is about 200 million a year. Uh, and one of the, the areas where we're really ramping up our effort is in uh, solving that logistics problem, finding techniques um, at, a, at a relatively small scale that will be economic at a small scale close to the farm or the forest or the urban area where the biomass is produced where we can convert that biomass to what we call a logistically favorable intermediate. In other words, something easier to haul around than those bales of hay I used to throw. Right. And we've got a couple different pathways we're pursuing, but if we can get to that point where we can bring that vast amount of biomass economically to a central point where we can convert it at scale, we can, then we can then employ technologies like what Renmatix is developing, followed by the tools of synthetic biology to convert it to the fuels and products that we need. Okay, hold that thought. I want to go to John Mello. John, your company has created hundreds and hundreds, maybe nearly a thousand jobs in a relatively short period of time. I want to hear Paul talk about synthetic biology. I know that's at the heart of what you do. The one thing I want to ask you is what is synthetic biology? But the other thing I'd, I'd like to understand, we'd like to understand is uh, you get your sugars from Brazil completely, totally, overwhelmingly. Is that good? Why do you get them from Brazil and does having renewable sugars from biomass in America make any sense? Me, uh, let me try to address that, and it'll be kind of a broken record here very quickly. All right. Uh, and it probably starts with Paul's budget, but let's then uh, move on from there very quickly, right? Yeah. It, it's, sort of, uh, it's sort of simple. So uh, on the first area of jobs creation, I mean, today, if I, if I look at our biomass access, it represents about 225,000 acres of processing capacity uh, in, uh, in, in Brazil. So that's how much that's how biomass much we have, under, we have under your company's control. That's exactly right. We have access to under our agreements, right? Uh, and if I think about the jobs, you know, if I think about just our main R&D facility in California, we now have uh, about 400 people. We have 120 or so working uh, in Brazil. And if I think about all the plants we work with and all of our partners, it represents really thousands of jobs now involved uh, in the area right. that we're interested in, which is using uh, synthetic biology to convert biomass into products. So thousands of new jobs that didn't exist four years ago, right? We, we have uh, in the U.S. alone 400 jobs that didn't exist five years ago. Right. Uh, and if I think about our total network, there are thousands of jobs. Some of them are jobs that, uh, I mean, I'll give you a great example, our Tate and Lyle facility in Decatur, Illinois. Right. It was a facility that actually had shut down the, mm -hmm. the processing capacity we're using. They had laid off their people. They were out of work in Decatur, Illinois. And there wasn't really an obvious next place to go work. So we, we were accessing that facility. 
We're now using biomass from uh, Tate and Lyle's acid base and have re-employed the people that they laid off. And I look at that as a perfect example of it isn't necessarily all new hires, but it's people who otherwise wouldn't be at work because the things they were working on were not, were not being used. Right. So uh, it's great for economic development. But it, let, let's talk about the, uh, the cane in Brazil and, and why. Uh, I mean, if, I, if I look at our plants today, we have three plants operating and two very large plants under construction. One plant operating in, uh, in Brazil, in Piracicaba. Uh, one plant operating in Leon, Spain and then one pl plant uh, that's coming online in the next couple of weeks in Decatur, Illinois. When I look at all three plants, the thing that matters most to us is the input, it's the feedstock. Uh, and the place we have the most access to feedstock is in Brazil, why? Because it's the lowest cost, largest scale feedstock we could get our hands on. So what, what do I really care about? And what my, my answer to your question about the wand is, uh, I'd like to get all the sugar I can at 12 to 14 cent a pound equivalent, and I really don't care where it comes from. And unfortunately, in the US, number one, it's not available at that cost, number two, it's not available at scale, and number three, there isn't the infrastructure we need uh, to be able to take advantage of the biomass that's available in the US. So as a result, I mean, to think about Brazil today, just the Brazilian oil company, which has more recent reserves than any other place in the world, is investing $5 billion in its own need for biomass. The Brazilian government is supporting 50 to $60 billion of investment between now and 2020. Why? Because cane matters. It's the lowest cost, largest scale access to biomass today with a built-in infrastructure. So I think the opportunity for the US, and my, my simple answer, I'd love to make products in the US. To do that, we need an infrastructure, and we need investment, and we need good technology to be able to actually turn the biomass into very cheap sugars, or said differently, a very cheap renewable source of light, sweet crude. Light, sweet crude, and then that substitutes for oil. For oil. Now, tell me about the biology here. I've heard this term synthetic biology, and I'm also very interested when you get your sugar from Brazil, what then does your company do with it, and how does it do it? We put it in big tanks. Big tanks. Uh, very large uh, stainless steel tanks. And then we ferment, just like you make wine, just like you make beer, just like you make bread. Same exact process. And, and uh, what, is, what does it mean to ferment? We, we, uh, we use yeast, Yes. like Fleischmann's yeast packages, except we've actually taken that yeast and have re-engineered it. Uh, said differently, we have rewritten the DNA inside that yeast so that instead of it, instead of it eating the carbon, and making beer, making wine, or making uh, uh, yeast for bread, we actually program it to make a hydrocarbon. And yeast is bugs, right? Yeast is the bug. What do these bugs do with the sugars? Uh, they crap good fuel. They, they, they do what? <laughs> they crap good fuel. They I mean, it's really, they crap, it's really the simplest. They crap new yeah. fuel? Good fuel. Good fuel. Good fuel, as opposed to good alcohol. Bugs. Good bugs. Right. They they're, eat they're, the sugar, and they. We, we train them extensively. Fuel. We train them extensively, right? They take a lot of training. Some don't <laughs> behave very good. I mean, they take a lot of training, and we throw some of them away. Hey, you know, the I, ones this that is do not where well. I expected this conversation to go. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, you have to somehow bring crap back, but Paul started it, I have to tell you. Uh, in, in the government, we say they secrete valuable product. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you train these bugs to eat sugar and excrete valuable products? We, we have... Uh, Part of our patent portfolio and what we do distinctively different as a company is we've turned, almost industrialized the process of engineering those bugs. Right. So we literally sit there in a sequence of DNA. Uh, we now have uh, extensive computer modeling and databases. So imagine, as a biologist, you can, you can have a bright idea. You can say, you know, I'd like to change the DNA sequence of that bug to be uh, ACTG, blah, 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 blah. So you go to your computer screen, you actually tell it that's exactly what you want to do in a point and click way. You select what you want, you put it in where you want it, and you say print. Mm -hmm. Then we go to uh, freezers that have extensive libraries of DNA for, these, for, for this yeast, and then we actually put that into an assembly, into a plate. Then we use robots that can actually uh, create variations of that one uh, program right. a million or millions of times in a single day. And by getting those variations right, what you're actually doing is tuning the yeast 
to give you exactly what you want at the efficiency you want. And that, that's a very, very, uh, it's a very extensive process that's all about iterations. So you're constantly just iterating, 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 yeah, yeah, constantly you. getting the bug to be very efficient at making the product you want. That's, that's really what it is. You engineer, you put it in tanks, you get it to ferment, you make the product. And for what products are you doing this today? Uh, uh, bring, it, bring it home to something that I yeah, buy or need. Here's a, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. So uh, if you drive a diesel vehicle, mm. uh, we make today the best, by far, renewable diesel fuel in the world. It's not biodiesel, it's not a plant oil diesel, it's actually a, uh, a hydrocarbon, pure diesel. Uh, recently it's been tested by Mercedes, by Audi, by Volkswagen, uh, Cummins, by just about every major diesel manufacturer uh, in the world, and they've basically come out and said, not only is it the best renewable diesel, it actually improves the performance and emissions of our vehicle. Yeah, but I, okay, I have one question. Is this gonna be affordable? Is this gonna be competitive? We're, uh, we're, we're currently supplying buses in the Sao Paulo bus fleet, uh, and uh, we're moving to the Rio bus fleet uh, very soon. So far, by the end of this year, we'll have probably three to 400 buses supplied by our fuel, uh, and we see it as competitive with alternative renewable products. So if you think about it today, the only real renewable solution in the diesel pool is biodiesel, uh, which comes from palm oil, from soybeans, from other plant sources, and we can compete. So you see it differently. It's almost a dollar less per unit to make our product than it would be uh, that plant oil-based product. Okay, so that's an example of a fuel. What's another product that you would make using these magic bugs? The, I'll give you a couple of others. From, uh, from Bill. The, the other one that you might know very well, if you, uh, if you buy Castrol GTX or you buy Mobile One, which is a high-performance synthetic motor oil for most new engines, they take a group four, group three base oil, which is kind of the base product inside that motor oil, uh -huh. and that's a product we make, as an example. Okay, so uh, I've got a fuel and a chemical. A lubricant. A lubricant from the... Third, the third example, which is my, my favorite, uh, we have a product called Squalane, which is Squay the... Uh, Squalane. That sounds like a fish. It, it actually, uh, it, one of the sources is shark liver oil. <clears throat> uh, and, you know, we, we are, we're a company that comes out of uh, an anti-malaria product as our first application. So the thing, the thing that gets our people most excited right. is actually having a huge impact. And right. one of the things they can't stand is that in Japan, they still hunt sharks for this product to, to go into uh, lotions. Anything that makes your skin soft, the highest performing ingredient that goes into those lotions is this product called Squalane. So we have a way, we have a bug that today uh, is commercially viable. We, we've actually sold out our supply for this year and next year already of renewable, sustainable Squalane. So we're taking uh, sugar syrup or a syrup from sugar cane, using our bugs in a tank and making this squalane that to goes save, into- To save sharks. To save the sharks. So we're really excited about that application. Yeah, well, there's another example of the ocean and the physicist and the <laughs> chemist all coming I mean, together. The, the other, one of my other favorite ones is uh, cleaning detergents, cleaning products for the house. Right. And most, most cleaning products have surfactants as some of their core ingredients. Uh, and we have a whole line of surfactants. We're actually launching a whole new line in Asia uh, for the Chinese market. And we have an agreement here in the U.S. with Procter & Gamble uh, for surfactants into some of their core products. And, and that's another great application where because it's, it's uh, coming from the biology, we're able to actually tune the molecule to perform what we want it to do. In this particular case, we want cold water performance that's as good or better than hot water performance because there's no need to heat the water if you can actually get cold water to clean as well as hot water does today. I have two more questions and then I want to go to Vic. Uh, I've heard a, a broad range of products. I understand you need a different bug for each of these products. How many bugs have you made to get to the ones that are the best? Uh, it's millions. How many? Millions. Millions of bugs. Millions. Different bugs you've made. Millions. And how do you keep track of them? Do you name these or? We have, uh, we have uh, ex uh, extensive number of Google servers. We have several terabytes of data. Uh, we now are at a point, we're so advanced, where we barcode every single barcode plate. Barcode the bugs? Uh, we barcode the plate the bugs go on. Yeah. So we can actually track all the way through the cycle exactly what's happening with the bugs 
Uh, and I have to say that we probably have more data than we could ever know what to do with. How many bugs a day do you mix, different bugs? Today we can engineer uh, and test uh, a little over a couple of million bugs a day. A couple of million bugs a day. Million bugs per day, right. different bugs. Right. Yeah. Wow. Right, because keep in mind that the amazing thing about these bugs is one little change can change over a million different chemical reactions inside the bug. And that always blows me away. I mean, you literally can't see this bug unless you're under a microscope, and you know it's a bug. And you think there's a million different reactions going on inside this little organism. So, uh, Vic, is DuPont uh, growing millions of bugs? And what kind, I've heard this story from John. What's going on at DuPont? Yeah. John, we have in our in industrial biosciences division about uh, 650 scientists dedicated to biotechnology. Right, synthetic uh, biology? Synthetic biology, uh -huh. but integrating it with engineering and chemistry. And are, are those in Pennsylvania or California? All over the world. All over the world. All over the world. We have a large Europe. group in, in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh -huh. We have, uh, through our acquisition of uh, Danisco, a large presence in right. Palo Alto, California. Right. But we have offices in the Netherlands, in China, in India, all over the world. So John really expanded my mind with the range of products that they're making out of these bugs. What is DuPont aiming to make or making products? Yeah. Yeah. Same things? Yeah, today we have about a billion dollars of revenue coming in from sustainably made products. Mm -hmm. And uh, our emphasis is to really s do two things. One is we've developed a number of platforms. Uh, for example, our Biopedio platform uh, makes 1,3-propane-diol a key intermediate. 1,3-propane-diol. Diol. Yeah, we call it PDO for short. PDO, oh yeah. yes, I know that. And it's the basis of uh, a very important fiber that DuPont originally couldn't make through chemistry. Mm -hmm. It was not cost competitive. So we use biology, synthetic biology, to make 1,3-propane-diol in a, we do it in a, in a facility in Decatur, Illinois, with our partner, Tate & Lyle. Right. And from there, 1,3-propane-diol is then shipped to a number of polymer processing facilities all over the world. We have one in, in Kinston, North Carolina. We make it into polymer pellets. That then is converted into fibers, and the fibers go to make a, a number of uh, uh, apparel uh, garments, as well as uh, a carpet. So we're bringing sustainability into traditional industrial products. What, what would it take for DuPont to make all of its products out of bugs and cane or renewable sugars? Is that even conceivable in our lifetime? Clearly it is. It Clearly is. it's our goal. And, and we believe that uh, the, the topic we've been ta talking about is the, the biomass supply chain. Uh, we've got to work on that. And we're putting a lot of effort into that in Iowa. Um, and we're looking, we have to be global as well, but we're making a strong investment in the US in, in our supply chain. So I get the sense that this, this transformation depends on innovation, technology, synthetic biology, scientists, R&D, global sources of sugars from Brazil to around the world. And Paul, what else? What is it gonna take to have this revolution occur? Oh, well, a number of things, but I, I think uh, one of the biggest is we're going to have to attract uh, private capital. Money, it takes to this, money. To this, All right. And, and <laughs> private capital will flow as you well know, when yep. there's money to be made, uh, so so there has to be that um, there has to be the opportunity to make money, and there has to be a reasonable risk level. Mm -hmm. So uh, a fair amount of what we do at the Department of Energy is, is to try to bring that risk level to a point where private capital can flow in. Right. Uh, so we will, in addition to underwriting early R and D, uh, we'll we'll underwrite applied R and D piloting and even up to the point of what we call pioneer commercial facilities. These are the serial number one, the first of a kind commercial facility. Um, and as we know in the, in the large process industries like petrochemicals, like petroleum, the first time you build one of these, it's nowhere near as economical as the last time you build one. Even right. if technology yep. stays constant, yep. there's a learning curve. Yep. And it's very hard to get people to put their hard-earned capital into that first plant. You get that first plant built, there are a lot of learnings, and the follow-on plants become cheaper. Uh -huh. uh, but one of the things that, you know, the, the federal government gets used to dealing with massive sums of money, but even then they don't seem to recognize 
how large the petroleum industry is. Mm -hmm. uh, the petroleum industry, $300 billion a year in the United States on imported crude oil alone, that's enough to run the entire Apollo program twice every year. As you said, we borrow from the Chinese, we buy from OPEC, and we burn it two Apollo programs a year. Right, and, and of course we'd rather buy that from America and Absolutely. create jobs in America. Absolutely. But these are global markets. I mean, is there room to pay more for sugars from America than from some other place, or is this a? I, I, I don't think there is. I, I think that if we're going to be competitive in the global market, we have to drive the, the cost down. Um, I, I, I spoke earlier with one of my magic wands that you then took away, but I spoke earlier. Uh, uh, Congress took it away. <laughs> I didn't take it. Uh, well, that's, that's true, too. Um, the, uh, the magic wand about policy and the full societal cost of petroleum, if we, t if we put that to the side and we look at the renewable options, you know, what are the renewable options, we absolutely do have to compete with the other world sources of renewable energy, and sugars really are the source of renewable energy for transportation fuels. Uh, there's an old saying in the biofuels industry, and that old saying goes, high crude prices make biofuels look attractive. Right. They make petroleum pr projects look even more attractive. Uh -huh. Right? The, the way I paraphrase that with sugars is um, advanced technologies for sugar conversion have the potential to reinvigorate rural America. So they have even more potential to reinvigorate rural Brazil. All right. So, so we so, have to so get this, our this costs competitive. We have to be cost competitive. We do. These are technologies with really global implications. They, they are. They can improve economies all around the world. Uh, let's talk about technology for a moment. Mm -hmm. this, this day is not some kind of commercial for Medmatix, but I have to ask, one, are you familiar with what they're doing technically? And you have, I think, also a broad view of innovation that's going on. T tell us what Renmatix is doing and aspires to do and, and how, how good is that, how important? Sure. The, uh, the food-based biomass, whether it's uh, eaten by humans or eaten by animals, uh, a lot of the focus there is, is on the part that's easy to digest, that's easy to take apart in a biological way. So we ingest sugar, we ingest starch, we ingest fats and oils, we can digest those. But the majority of the biomass that's grown, either on purpose or in a natural way, is not like that. It's not easy to digest. It's polymers of sugars. Right. If you could look at it on a molecular level, you'd see sugar, but it's attached in a way that's not easy to digest. And that's essentially on purpose. Plants don't want to be easy to digest. They don't want microbes breaking them down. Trees and grasses and things could not grow if they were easy to digest. They'd fall apart because microbes would be eating them. So we have to come up with ways of taking the energy, the sugars that are inherently present, and breaking them down into, into forms that companies like Amaris and DuPont can convert into useful products. Okay. So if you go back to the genesis of, of my program, was really in 2005, 2006, in those days, you could have called my program the Office of Cellulosic Ethanol. That's what it was all yeah. about in those days. Kind of rolls off the tongue, doesn't and it? <laughs> and, 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 I, and I like to say that it was, it, was such an, it was seen as such an important thing that President Bush learned to pronounce the word cellulosic. <laughs> all right, I'm, I'm not getting into politics today. <laughs> but uh, the, and, and ethanol, I, I don't want to demonize ethanol as a fuel, but you can only go so far with ethanol. It only replaces gasoline, and you can only add so much ethanol to gasoline before you run into infrastructure problems. But the front end of that, the front end of cellulosic ethanol is making that cellulosic material into sugar. Okay, but my question is, how, how good is Renmatix's technology or approach to this? Ah, how good is Renmatix's technology? That's, what is their technology? Well, I, that I can say a little bit about. How good it is, I have to, I have to take a neutral position representing the Department of Energy. What I will say is Renmatix is right in the critical space of converting biomass into fermentable sugars. What Renmatix has is a, a very efficient way uh, without using dangerous solvents or additives of converting biomass polymers into fermentable sugars. 
So it's making that connection between the raw biomass that's not particularly useful for any industrial purpose and converting it into those sugars that DuPont and Amaris can make into useful products. And do they use bugs to do this? What, what, how do they do it? Again, not having seen the secret scrolls, uh, I can't comment. And if I had seen them, I really couldn't comment. But uh, based on what I understand of the rheumatics process, they really use water as a solvent under supercritical conditions uh, to break down those sugars very rapidly and make them available for biological conversion. Supercritical water. Supercritical water. To feed sugars to the bugs. Exactly. Now, Vic, are you in a position, not on behalf of DuPont, but just as a scientist and business leader, to comment on this approach? And if so, what would you say? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think uh, the, the problem is so large, and the importance of finding a suite of solutions is so critical. I think all approaches are very important to, to pursue. Uh, DuPont has uh, pioneered using uh, an approach using enzymes, mm -hmm. but we are also using thermochemical methods, and so we applaud the approaches that Renmatix and other companies are taking right. to attack this uh, to a complex set of solutions, because certainly different kinds of biomass in different geographies are going to require different technologies to liberate these sugars and allow us to have cost-effective solutions. Excellent, thank you. Now, John, in closing, I would like to hand you two magic wands. And as a third challenge, pose to you the same question I asked, asked Vic and Paul. What do you know of this rheumatics technology? Uh, is, is it promising? How does it fit in, uh, in this brave new world of, uh, of uh, sugars being the new oil? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say a couple of things. Uh, we're, we're very active as a company in the space, new technologies that are coming in to try to convert biomass into sustainable, cheaper sources of sugar long term. You're searching the world for cheap I'm, sugars. I'm, I'm searching the world for cheap sugars. Right. We buy a lot of it today, and we'd like to buy more of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I think about where Renmatic sits, I mean, we, we deal with companies who have uh, processes that use acid to break it down. We use uh, other chemistry to break it down. Uh, and I kind of like this one because it's simple. It's uh, simple. I think, I think uh, although if you walk through and you see the many wood steps, you think it's very complicated. The reality is using water in the process and going through the breakdown steps to get to uh, the, the, the different kinds of sugars, I think, is a very simple process. And I think the big challenge all the companies face, including Redmatix, is uh, a race to scale. Uh, and I think the advantage they have is they've got a pilot plant that's uh, already uh, in operation in Georgia. And they've got this facility they're building out. And I, I think with a bit of capital and support, uh, they'll get there. And they'll get there because uh, I see in all these other companies, everybody's getting to that edge of just getting into the money with being able to have their technologies be able to scale. So I, I no longer think this is a 10-year out solution. I think in three to five years, we can be in a, a point where we have very competitive sugars coming from uh, an alternative technology at a competitive cost. And the issue then really goes down to Paul's uh, challenge, which is infrastructure. So I think whoever gets the infrastructure game right and the right technology like Renmatix put together, there will be, uh, there will be no lack of demand. Uh, no lack of demand. No lack of demand. I mean, today, just to connect the dot on demand, I have, I mean, you know, I, I think Vic's comments about DuPont, until their recent acquisition, I was probably 2x their R&D department in this area. So I look at this and say, actually, I think the chemical companies are just waking up and saying, uh, and a lot of it because they've been in the game for a long time. But DuPont's ahead of the others. DuPont is ahead of everyone else. And I think uh, as a result of DuPont's acquisition, the rest of the world's woken up and said, this is for real. We must all play. Since DuPont's acquisition, I've had every major chemical company in Asia, the major chemical companies in Brazil, all contact me saying, could we please talk to you? about how it is we could integrate your platform into doing products for us. Because they want to work with you to compete with DuPont. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And we like that. Yeah. Well, Not that I don't like it's him. It's the great American way. <laughs> okay, so you have your magic wand. Right. Two from me. Let's close. What are you going to do with that? What do you wish? What do I wish? Uh, I think the first is uh, a realization that easy money isn't always the best money. 
And so it, here's what I mean by that. And if I go back four or five years ago, there was a run uh, in all the venture funds looking for energy as kind of their ne the next big aha. Uh, it's kind of your ET, energy technology space. Right. Uh, and that was great, because I think it, it, it seeded and got off the ground quite a few interesting technologies that have a lot of promise, including us. I don't think we'd be where we are today without the help of Kleiner and, and your leadership, John. Uh, I look at today, and it's almost like everybody's decided, well, you know, that's pretty hard stuff. Let's go, let's go to this uh, social thing. Because, you know, there's got to be another Facebook, and that'll be a quick <coughs> turn on the dime. So let's go social. Do you all have any clue how big the advertising market is globally? It's probably less than synthetic rubber globally, or said differently, it's less than what goes into a tire globally if you include all the products. And I look at that and say, look, let's think about this. Uh, let's not forget, chemicals is as big as fuels, and each of them could represent about three trillion dollars a piece. I don't think you're gonna get anything in the advertising world to be even close to a trillion dollars. So the breakout opportunity here is big. Not only is it big, I think about my children. It was interesting, my, my wife recently, we were just driving back from a trip and she says, you know, I had a hard time sleeping last night. I said, what do you mean? Well, it just, I, it just sunk in. You've been talking about 50 years of crude that's accessible. And then the next 50 years is gonna get very hard, which means the next 100 in total is just gonna be a declining position for crude oil in the world. And I look back and think, this is what she was saying to me. She's older than I am. She was saying, I'm turning 50. That means actually, if I just look at my life, we've got like the rest of my life left in having kind of the life we become accustomed to. What will our grandchildren do? And she was like really stressed out about this. What will our grandchildren do? And I think that is the fundamental issue. It's really interesting that we kind of take for granted that crude comes over on a ship. We celebrate the fact that Brazil offshore has, has gotten the biggest reserve fines in recent years. You realize that all of the Brazil offshore today represents about two to three years of US demand. That's it. That's it. I mean, I don't know about you, but I worry deeply that we, we have a problem on our hands. Uh, and the reason I'm here is because I think Rhinematics is a part of that, but it's a part of it. I mean, we need every solution possible to be able to create a bunch of wedges for a portfolio. Because it's not that crude is going to go away tomorrow, it's that it's going to get very, very expensive. We're going to have a, a world where war is going to be the norm because everyone's going to be fighting for that natural resource. I, I think today, almost anywhere I go, whether it's in Africa, whether it's Brazil, anywhere where there's natural resources, guess who's right behind me cutting a deal to access those resources long term at whatever price? It's China. I don't think most people have any idea how much resource China has tied up for the long term. They're focused on the 50 to 100 year agenda. They don't want to be caught out without product and they don't care how much they pay for it. So in this new hyper-connected global world of innovation and markets and renewables, where does America stand? This is my last question. What's America's role? Is America the technology leader, the laggard, the innovator, the fast follower? It's, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, John, and I, I'll, I'll speak from what we know today. Yeah. What we don't know is we don't know what labs around the world are doing work that we can't see. So what do you think? So if, if, we, if, we, if we look at what we see today, there's no question that the U.S. has technology leadership. No, no. question. We're number one. Number one in the world. And by the way, in the biospace, uh, absolutely the case. I do not see anything outside the U.S. that's where the U.S. is. On the other hand, when it comes to accessing natural resources, there are places in the world that are deeply strategic. The U.S. is not strategic. The U.S. is focused on the next Congress and the next president. And as a result, it's very hard to actually have any policy that sustains a source of carbon for us long term. Uh, but that's okay, because I guess we don't mind paying the price. <laughs> I guess so. So let me summarize what I've uh, learned and we've talked about today. Uh, we've talked about sugar is the next crude, the new crude. Uh, carbon is in everything that we uh, consume and produce to, to a vast degree. That there's a third wave of innovation. IT, information technology, BT, biotechnology, and ET, these new energy technologies. 
and they sweep across the worlds of biology, physics, and chemistry into the ocean and back out, that uh, this is a very innovation-driven, science-driven kind of uh, new part of the economy that's going to transform large existing markets based on billions and billions, not of burgers, but bugs, billions and billions of bugs. And America is the innovation leader. Done right, this can revitalize the American economy. It can help e make even rural parts of America more prosperous. And uh, that uh, Ren Maddox is uh, one of the leaders with a role to play in this industry alongside of companies such as Amaris and, and DuPont, but that innovation, federally funded innovation, research and development is uh, an essential part of getting this new industry going. And, uh, and Governor, that the state of Pennsylvania could be ground zero for uh, this kind of new innovative world. I'd like to thank each of you. Join me in thanking the panel. Great panel, great conversation.